not at all from Northwestern Europe. It's from Montenegro, where I, where I do some of my field work. But this is the only pretty picture we have to show. Uh, most of what I will have to show is pretty much charts, maps, numbers, and the like. Um, so the question that I will try to ask is, do lowlands stand out? So in the, in, in the session abstract, lowlands were defined as 200 meter ESL. Um, but when we defined lowland, elevation is just one element. We can look at the slope, we can look at various indications of terrain, like TRI, terrain rugged, ruggedness index, and so on. Uh, I'm not gonna go full on GIS here. I'm gonna keep a simple elevation aspect. But the one thing I will do is that rather than have a set value at 200 meters, I will take a series of case studies across Europe and show that actually the value per se that cannot be fixed. It has to be changed according to the nature of each of the landscapes. Uh, and from that point of view, what is actually very important is not so much to look at lowland, but to look at the lowland in connection to the associated upland, even if this upland cannot necessarily be mountainous. It's just the difference between those two, which is of interest to me. And from that point of view, what I want to see is, firstly, do different types of lowland across North West, northern Western Europe have different trajectories? And secondly, do lowlands actually differ from the corresponding uplands? Is there a point to single out lowlands as a valid analytical unit all the time? Uh, in order to do that, I have a small sample of 5,798 uh, 5, sites. Uh, which are all coming from commercial archaeology or development archaeology. That's the outcome of a project that I was involved in, uh, run by Colin Hazelgrove and Richard Bradley, which was published a few years ago. All the data is available online. Um, it's a sample, so it's 10 years of one type of archaeological practice going across Neolithic, Bronze, and Iron Age. <laughs> so this is just one sample, but it is a fairly extensive sample. Um, but as any sample, it comes with an awful lot of problems. It's a sample, first. And the second thing, obviously, it comes from development of archaeology, which is something that we will have to consider. So if you're dealing with a sample, how do you actually tackle a sample? Well, you can look, compare it with a random distribution, because a random distribution will give you a null model. If it was random, it should look like that. Are all data random? Or do they exhibit patterns? And if they are patterns, can we actually say something about those patterns? And that's where the world of GIS comes in handy, and especially spatial statistics. So if we go back to the data, we can use something which is called a replay K, or a slightly different from a version, which is a replay L function. <coughs> the, the idea of a replay function is to check whether or not a distribution of points is clustered or extremely spread, comparing to a random noise. So that you can see whether or not sites have a tendency to aggregate, for instance, using specific part of the landscape, or not. Um, not gonna go through the math, but the interesting thing about the replay <coughs> function is that it does that at different scales. So that you, know, you can actually see, if you look at the example, the blue line is the random noise. If your distribution is above, you have a clustered points, and in this case, all the clustering happens at small scale. Once if you move under the, the random, you have a distribution which is much more dispersed than the randomization. That's the result of the data. Um, you cannot really see it because of the scale, but across, around the, the, the dotted red line, there is actually gray, which shows the envelope, all the simulation, all the range. You cannot see the range because the data is so very, very, very clustered there is an awful lot of clustering. There is something going on in the distribution of the sites which is extremely patent. The question is, why is it patent? Um, one thing which probably explains the patterning is the fact that we as archaeologists excavate in specific parts of the landscape, especially when we're dealing with commercial archaeology, because we go where the, where the economy is. Um, this is a classification of land types, so artificial, urban areas, agriculture, and so on. And what you have, that's the distribution of my data set. That's the, distri the random distribution, and you can see they're totally different. And if you really want to go full on, the p-value is significant. So we are creating something which is not representative of the landscape as it stands. Um, 
Interestingly, if you do the game, for instance, by comparing any type of trial trenching versus excavation, these are exactly the same trends, which implies that the, na the nature of the work does not differ. However, if you compare housing versus quarry versus road, you can see that distribution fluctuates. So according to the kind of work you will look at, you will have different distribution and so on and so on. Another thing that we can look at is correlation between the distribution and another factor. That's word of spatial autocorrelation. And in this case, I've tried to see whether or not the distribution of site is correlated with elevation. So do sites which have the same elevation tend to be close to each other. And as you can see, it's very, very tight distribution. There is a beautiful regression line going through. There is a high element of clustering, which indicates that all archaeological sites in patterning is strongly dictated by elevation, which could be very interesting, up to the point that you put the same data for randomization, and you discover that the random data is even more clustered. <laughs> Why? Just because a landscape is clustered. You just do not have random points at 100 followed by one meter, and so on, and so on, and so on. So in this case, the fact that the archaeological data is related to elevation is just a property of the landscape. It is not a property of the archaeology. Irrelevant. If you want to look for it, you have to go to another way. Um, I've taken three case studies, uh, sort of central Paris basin. The one I want to look at is the difference between a river valley and a corresponding plateau. poitou charente uh, not so much west, northern, but western, where the difference is more between kind of seaside area and a corresponding hinterland. And Belgium, where we do have lowlands, but also sand versus loose area. So there are different categories here which are overlapping. Um, what you have here are simple bar charts where I have crunched the data according to very broad chronological categories. So early, middle, late Neolithic, late Neolithic, Bronze Age, early Bronze Age, and so on, so on, so on. And I'm just visualizing the number of sites we have the chronological value. Um, and you can see that in all cases, you have an explosion with the late Iron Age, which is not really a surprise. What is interesting, however, is that when you compare those three distributions, doing simple chi-square, every single of them is different from the other one. So we do have three historical sequences, at least in the, no in the fluctuation in the number of sites, which is specific to each of the regions. So there is a history of each of the regions which is of interest. What I want to know now is whether or not those different histories are translated in terms of lowlands. Um, if we go for the central Paris, don't worry, I'm not going to go through the entire structure of the archaeology in each case. Once more, my L function shows that it's highly clustered. Um, this is the kind of land type which is being used, so I know for a lot of work happening, for instance, in agricultural dominated areas. Let's go for the interesting thing. Uh, what you have here is another version of my bar plot, but in this case, I've used the jitter plot. So every single dot is a site using the same broad classification in terms of different periods, but they classify them according to the elevation. And I have put this line here, is the threshold that I have somewhat arbitrarily chosen for this area at 80 meters. And you have here the distribution of the sites between, before, below 80 and above 80 meters. You can definitely see that the distributions are different. One is located in the river valley, the other one is located in the uplands. Uh, there is a strong tendency to have more sites in the river valley in terms of numbers, but when you actually do a test to see whether or not the sequence are different, p-value says no. What you have is that the lowlands and the uplands fluctuate exactly the same way. So at least from a quantitative point of view, the number of sites per period changes from one period to the next, the same way between the uplands and the lowlands. So from that point of view, the lowlands do not stand out. Um, one can repeat for poitou charente exactly the same level of clustering, different type of uh, modern landscape being excavated. I do exactly the same. In this case, I've taken a 60 meter. You can definitely see the difference between the use of certain river valleys <coughs> and the kind of uh, swampy seaside area versus the upland. Same jitter plot. When you do your chi-square, once more, there is no difference. Once more, the lowlands and the uplands in terms of quantity 
and changes in terms of number of cycle periods are just following the same trend. Let's go for Belgium. Um, the clustering is extremely high. Now, there is a chart missing here. As you may have noticed, I like to repeat my slides. Um, the reason there is not a chart there is because there is a trick with Belgium. There is something called the linguistic border. So that the archaeology, as it is done for the north, is very different as the archaeology is done for the south, which happens to be also, roughly speaking, the archaeology between the lowlands and the uplands. So I have to be a little bit more attention, pay a little bit more attention to the potential differences in my two different areas in the way the archaeology is being done before I can jump to the conclusion regarding whether or not lowlands stand out. So what I have done here is use exactly the same technique. So these are uh, the distribution of type of land type, and I have broken them in three categories, housing, pipeline, road, railway, cable, which are the main three type of work which are being followed. So that accounts for the bulk of the distribution. And what you can see is that obviously it's always in mostly um, a very urban or suburban areas, but actually the all those numbers differ quite a lot. Um, I played, I've done an awful lot of uh, stats on it. It's always different. It's always a statistical <laughs> difference between Flanders and Wallonia. The way the work is organized is just very, very, very different. It is the outcome of very different legal framework, which is the outcome of very different practices, which means that the archaeology is not conducted in the same way. And therefore, we are not sampling in the same way the landscape. Keep that in mind, because when we actually go back to the jitter plot and the distribution of birds, we get a significant value. In this case, the distribution of sites and the distribution of sites per period between the lowlands and the upland is statistically different. There are differences. And I just highlighted so I can at least show you something that remotely looks like archaeology. Um, for the early Neolithic, you definitely have the big LBK phase, which is located in the Plandish area. Whilst if you go, for instance, for late Neolithic or Middle Bronze Age, you have the, develop the development of very specific type of architecture, which are more in the lowland area and not in the upland area. So in this case, we have a quantitative difference which we also know goes with a qualitative difference when we go into the archaeology. The problem is that even though there is a difference here, how much of that is related to the past and how much of that is biased or not by the fact that there are very different practices in the way the archaeology is done becomes a little bit of a problem. It's not because you have a correlation that you necessarily have a causation. So to conclude, uh, gray literature I think is an outstanding but totally biased sample. The fact that it is biased, at least from my point of view, makes it very fun, because you can try to control the bias, you can try to identify those bias, and that's where, for instance, stats or spatial stats, this is fairly simple, um, can be very useful. If we take a look at the first two case studies, Central Paris Basin, Porto Charente, the lowlands do not stand out, at least from a quantitative point of view. I am not going into the qualitative, but from a quantitative point of view, the long trend in terms of settlement history, they're just the same in terms of fluctuation. Belgium, there is a difference. And it's interesting because not only you have a difference in terms of elevation, but these also eco, for instance, differences between the fact that one is a sandy area and the other one is a loose area and so on. But bad luck, this is also the area where the archaeology is done in a very, very, very different way. So that I would be very happy to say that the lowlands are, and I'm pretty sure that they are different, but I cannot fully say it because I still have the way that the, the archaeology is being done. Um, and as a conclusion, obviously this is kind of big picture going through an awful lot of things, but I think it's helpful to provide a very, very robust framework when you want to go into the smaller and the high resolution studies, which are generally favored when looking about the lowlands. 15 minutes and 5 seconds, despite being late to start, I'm on time to finish. Thank you very much for your attention.